Write about shrinking spaces. Write about the color green. Write a line of top trees. Write a symphony of broken dreams. Write yourself an optimist. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Queen Sarkar and the lines I have recited have been written by someone who is not burdened with drumming symbolism and his trionic reality. Her poems are suffused with pulsating, almost magical spontaneity and confiding intimacy. She uses the commonplace as prism, splitting the bands with which it plays into a surprising spectrum of color. According to eminent poet Jahant Mahapatra, she is one who stabs you through the heart. Yes, you guessed it right. She is none other than the award-winning poet and writer Vinita Agarwal, who is widely recognized for her eco-poetry. Author of four books of poetry, Two Full Moons, Words Not Spoken, The Longest Pleasure, and The Silk of Hunger, Vinita is also a recipient of Ravindranath Tagore's Literary Prize 2018 and Gayatri Garmersh Memorial Award for Literary Excellence USA in 2015. Her poems have appeared in various international and national journals and e-zines including Asian Cha, Constellation, The Fox Chase Review, P Review Journal, Poetry Pacific, Mithila Review, Chandrabhaga, Blue Fifth Review, The Bombay Review and other journals and in anthologies in Australia, Ireland and Israel. She was nominated for the Best of the Net Awards in 2011 and her poem uh, won the Moon Anthology on the Moon Tall Grass, Writers Guild 2017. She was awarded the first prize in the World Weavers Contest in 2014 and a commendation prize for all India Poetry Competition in 2014. She also co-curates events for Spend Mumbai and sub-curates for the Kala Ghora Literary Festival. I welcome you to TYMS Academy, ma'am. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Queen. Thank you for that warm introduction. Pleasure to be here. Same here, ma'am. And we are, we are really honored to have you here. So I want to begin with, I mean, as you know, I already said that, you know, your poems, I mean, your eco poems, I mean, they are, uh, they're, they're very different from, you know, what environmental poetry or ecological poems or uh, the part of Anthropocene that, you know, we have been reading and dealing with. So, you know, tell us more about this genre of eco poetry and what inspired you to write eco poems. Okay. Well, your, your question addresses a theme which is very close to my heart, especially now because this whole anthology on climate change is just about to be released on September 10th. So uh, basically, eco-poetry is something that all writers and uh, poets and, and authors, you know, they have they've responded to, to that theme in some way or the other. Because as you know that in the natural world, uh, you know, it's almost on the verge of a catastrophe. So many species are going extinct and uh, all aspects of climate change are very worrying and, and the way the climate has deteriorated is something that we all need to ponder on and, and writers need to respond to that. So I too feel very strongly on the subject. I feel that it is almost, uh, it's almost perilous right now the way the earth is shaping and, and human greed is actually shaping the earth more than anything else. It is no longer the natural forces but our own sovereign, you know, uh, all our deeds which are which, which stem from immense greed the greed aspect of human nature which is destroying our planet so i felt very strongly about this and i've been uh, leaning towards that theme in a lot of my poetry okay so do you think that uh, eco poetry is a necessary component to instigating a change in how we interact with the other than human world i mean and how does this eco poetry relate to uh, the concept of sustainability and biophilia yeah, that's a very good question you know because apparently uh, poetry is just poetry you know how can poetry change the earth in fact there is a very famous book by um, john filsner who talks about can poetry change the earth so uh, apparently well it's just words but but the truth is that i believe that poetry can bring about a change and the reason why i believe that poetry can uh, bring about this change and bring about a greater awareness of what's happening on the earth is because poetry opens your eyes to the realities around you 
And according to John Fields, now, although that's, I find that a slightly narrow view, he says it invokes nature in so many ways that you want to go back to it. And in that sense, it makes the readers, uh, you know, feel more uh, strongly about getting back that whole balance of nature. But I personally feel it's about awareness. And my whole approach to it is from the sense of belief that if awareness can be, uh, can be brought about in the, in the readers' minds, then definitely there can be a change in attitude also. So that is my, that's my core belief. And also when you, when you, when you respond to things around you, when you sort of, uh, when you bring reality into focus, when you bring it into unmistakable focus, then it does uh, impact the reader's minds and, and everybody responds to it. And it's just, you know, it's just a small change of, of thought that's needed. It's just a small change in your attitude that is required. And that change in attitude can, you do your bit, you know, you're not going to become an ecologist by reading eco-poetry, nor are you going to become an activist by reading eco-poetry. But just in your own sphere, if you can bring about that small change, which is beneficial to the environment and the ecology as a whole, then that poetry becomes that much worthwhile. It, it, it seems to have served its purpose. So I am a very strong believer that yes, poetry uh, can bring about a change. It can bring about a small uh, difference in attitude, which is all that is required right now, honestly. Lovely, lovely. That's, that's a very, very beautiful explanation. I mean, yes, actually it can bring a change. I mean, the awareness is what, you know, we exactly. are actually focusing on and looking forward. Okay. But now many of your poems, I mean, concern uh, humanity's out of balance relationship with nature as well. Yes. So where do you think this comes from? I mean, uh, where, where is it this thought coming? I mean, this out of, you know, uh, out of balance relationship. Yeah, well, you know, I've been, um, I've been watching a few documentaries on, uh, on, on the planet and I want to quote uh, David Attenborough's documentary called Life on a Planet, Life on the Planet. And he says that almost 60% of animals, birds and fish have shrunk. Their population has shrunk by 60% in the past four decades. So, so it's very clear that it's something that man is doing out of greed that is creating this havoc and wreaking this havoc in nature, which is why so many animals and birds are going extinct and uh, climate is changing in a, in a drastic way. So I think it is all, the one answer is man. You know, even the bees are on the verge of extinction. Yeah. So if we don't change our way of life, if we don't start, behaving in a way that is responsible and, and, and remembering that we're leaving behind a legacy for the future generations and we can't exploit the limited resources of nature. Unless we don't keep these things in mind, we are just going to ravage the earth because all the resources are limited and our ravaging is not going to stop as long as capitalism exists and this, uh, you know, this whole thing for profit is, exists. So unless that changes, I don't think uh, anything can change. It's got to come from us. It came from us. The destruction has come yeah. from us and the construction or the, or the reconstruction of planet Earth as it was also should come from us. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned that, you know, uh, human beings are responsible for both this construction and deconstruction. It reminded me, you know, uh, uh, in my, uh, during my first job, I was actually taking up uh, uh, environmental management as one of these subjects. And there, you know, I uh, got, uh, I mean, I, I, I could read, you know, some of the destructions that, you know, uh, that were human made, whether it was the oil spilling case or, you know, even now, nowadays, uh, the way people are just, you know, uh, leaving their mask here and there like when you move out you will find that you know the face masks are on the road so actually you know this is actually creating a hazard not only to the environment but to other human beings as well so this awareness is very important and we need to understand that you know we all are connected so yes. thank you so much so ma'am uh, was there any moment or moment within a particular poem when the nexus between the poetry and environmental consciousness came home to you <laughs> yes actually many poems in fact all the poems that i've read on eco poetry have always always brought home that point and i have always felt uh, uh, i have always gone into a five minute at least a five minute silence after i read eco poetry and it's so moving and it is it is extremely thought provoking and you need to 
and one automatically responds with uh, with a sense of responsibility it's eye opening you know you feel that there is so much damage and innocent animals and birds and fish are suffering and so that really gets to me and i i feel that uh, um, eco poetry does bring about that shift in the heart and there are so many poems if you'd like if i if you if i have your permission i could read this yes small... absolutely i mean i was about to say that ma'am that if you could read some of your poems because you know that would be wonderful for the readers and the listeners sure i would like to read a poem titled arid so this poem is basically on this extreme uh, uh, dry climate in some parts of the world and it is so dry and water has become such a precious commodity so this poem is on that it's called arid so dry dryness with cracked heels barely a turban of shade on the head dryness that chocks the roots velvet suit soil unbuttoned to the waist i've lost the fingers of my son's rust hand in the earth's ochre crust the gay girl puppet sways in appropriate celebration orange sienna crimson all one in flat beige this hardness allows no footprints accommodates no seeds in its khadi uterus owns up only to cramped rib cages zeric nucleus eyes in my mind the chicken in the wire coop are saved by dense green intentions determined i scoop out the excess of sunlight from the air my head has enough dark spaces to take in endless illumination but nothing changes ours stay transfixed in heat i miss the moistness of rains its sarangi notes open fisted generosity the colors locked in its belly the yin to the yang of the throat people cavorting this shaken expanse breaks every promise that time ever made to life that of relenting a sheep with slumped shoulders walks through me i become a burned hoof a sore mouth rain could is the ache of the supine topography rain and rivers and water tables that brilliant liquid shimmering in dreams that women would trade with their blood but clouds too are deserts here deserts in the skies beautiful beautiful and so she did wonderful uh, okay ma'am my next question is i mean you have already uh, said about uh, awareness how you know poetry uh, aware people regarding these you know in environmental changes or the consequences that human beings have on environment and the realities of climate change and its devastating repercussions are more severe and much closer at hand than we ever imagined like if we look at the recent situation and now when we are talking about this eco poems and uh, we have already mentioned uh, uh, you know discussed about the awareness but do you think that you know Uh, poems can inspire action on climate change as well yeah i i totally think so i totally think so like i said uh, just to go back to that point of awareness if there mm-hmm. is awareness there is totally a change of mind if there is a change of mind there's a change in attitude there's a change in actions and that filters down it, it percolates down into the way that even the next generation is going to act it definitely changes the way we should act so i think that whole belief stands on this premise that uh, it's thought and attitude that culminates into action and action is what brings about change of course the ecologists are going to do their work they are going to give us uh, better ideas and better solutions of how to tackle this the activists are going to do their bit by bringing in a general public awareness but the writers have this duty and responsibility also to react in whatever capacity that they can and and their weapons are words their tools are words so as far as that aspect of that dimension of change is concerned the writers do uh, inspire people to act to change to bring about a better future for the next generation 
And now I'm talking about your other collections. I mean, whether it's words not spoken or two full moons, we find the cyclical voice. I mean, there is an esoteric philosophical debate, matter of uh, factness combined with an unexpected turn of emotions. Where did you get your inspiration from? Where do you get your inspirations from? I mean, who inspired you? What you read? What you write? What is what is yeah. you know uh, the uh, behind the uh, pen thing? Okay. Well, it's not one person in particular. No one person. I do read a lot of poetry and collectively it inspires me and gives me that epiphany to come out with my own work. But I think every poet delves deep down into his or her own consciousness. And um, I have always been uh, slightly spiritually inclined. That's that's my nature. I My poetry also is slightly... Uh, leaning towards you know existential questions and uh, finding answers where there are none or at least trying to find answers where there may be none so i try to look at things from a uh, top view and i try to make whatever is personal more universal because um, when someone you know who lives in some other corner of the globe can respond and resonate with your words then uh, in a sense you've kind of universalized your experience so I try to, uh, as far as possible, I try to look at things from uh, the outer perspective instead of, you know, the only the confessional aspect. But uh, I think the overall inspiration, there's so much good poetry out here, out there in the world. And, uh, and I don't want to name just the, because I'm sure I'm going to leave out all the important names. <laughs> so I think I just generally feel very inspired when I read a good piece of writing. And also uh, my own consciousness and my own core nature, which is slightly spiritually inclined. Uh, I think it shapes my poetry. Okay. Ma'am, uh, uh, what are your future projects? I mean, what are you writing now? I mean, what are we expected to read next? Okay, so right immediately what's going to come out is this anthology on climate change, which is titled Open Your Eyes. It's releasing on the 10th of September. And that's something I'm really looking forward to because it has these 63 poets from uh, many parts of the uh, of the globe, and they had the, it's full of these diverse voices uh, addressing different themes of uh, uh, ecology and environment. And I've edited the book with a wonderful foreword by Ranjit Hoskote, which is also very enlightening. So that's something I'm looking forward to immensely. And apart from that, I would like to. Uh, uh, focus a little bit on some translation work. Let's see, that's still in the pipeline, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but hopefully something on in the translations might come out. Um, uh, congratulations for your you know, uh, new anthology, Open Your Eyes, uh, uh, yeah. an anthology of climate change, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, with this you know, pandemic crisis, with this, I mean, this lockdown, you know, there are so many debates related to uh, poetry and how uh, the the entire climate or you know uh, everything related to uh, poetry is somehow connected but how do you think that what how your uh, anthology open your uh, eyes is different from you know the other projects that are coming on or the other poems that we are reading i mean what distinguishes it from any other anthology or eco poetry or ecological poems yeah, the fact that this is a consolidated work on eco-poetry is what distinguishes it from. There, there are many eco-poems out there, but this is one book, which is, this is one anthology, which is, which has this whole collection of uh, poems on the environment and on all aspects, almost all aspects of the environment, whether it's uh, trees or whether it's um, lack of water, or the, you know, the, um, or, or these, the mass fishing that takes place or other things that are uh, so so critical right now so it addresses almost and then there's this whole global voice you know in that in that anthology which is amplified into one plea to save the planet um i don't want to dramatize it too much but just just putting it concisely i'd say that it is one consolidated work of eco poetry which uh, is which will probably distinguish it from the others um, but yes, uh, all the flavors are there. It is poetry at the end of the day. And the craft is as important as the theme. 
So you get to see a lot of beautiful craft, diverse craft also in the anthology. Thank you so much, Pam. Looking forward to reading Open Your Eyes. And, you know, with this, uh, we uh, come to the end of this really interesting and uh, thoughtful session. And whenever I get this opportunity to have a conversation with a poet, I request them to recite one of their favorite poems before signing off. So over to you, ma'am. Oh, all right. So I'm going to read a really short, um, really short poem. Uh, which I wrote when my father had passed away. So it's called Gift. It is a gentle shape, this white moon, my father gave me the night he passed away. It hangs under the window every night, a farewell gift. Leaves the skies quietly at dawn to slide into my throat all day. Some nights it returns, chipped, halved, sliced, imitating life, scarred like the face of pain, but always there like a presence that's never left. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, you think like something. No, I was just saying thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be talking to you. Thank, thank you, you thank you, thank you so much. I, I, I hold a similar feeling. Thank you so much for being here, for being with TYMS. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.